I don't know about you, but I've begun to realize that somewhere I've picked up a kind of elitism when it comes to reading these stories from Scripture. I think it's easy, maybe a little too easy, for me to condescend to these people in the stories who don't get it. Today's story, the people in the crowd are a good example. When Jesus miraculously feeds them, they want to make him a king. Given his reaction, and what we will read in the coming weeks, this isn't exactly the response he was hoping for. So I'm tempted to treat them with a kind of benevolent disdain, to smile and chuckle at their ignorance. Do you feel that way too? Do you smile knowingly at these poor benighted folks because you can see what they can't or what they don't? Or maybe you're on the other side. Maybe you read this story and you think that you'd do just the same thing they did and you wonder if all those people can miss it, what hope is there for me? Someone asked in the Bible study this week if maybe we're being too hard on these poor folks for mistaking who Jesus is. They are, after all, hungry. And we don't always make the best decisions when we're hungry, do we? They are hungry, and Jesus feeds them. For people living as they did, simply struggling to subsist, anyone who can provide that kind of security is worth following at any cost. And so I wonder, if we were as hungry as they, would we have behaved any differently? Or would we also have tried to seize Jesus to make him our bread king? And as I wonder this, I'm aware that one of the biggest disruptions of this pandemic for many of us has been the loss of our sense of security. All of a sudden, danger lurked around every corner. Places we used to go as a matter of course, places like grocery stores and gas stations and restaurants and even churches became dangerous. It occurs to me that we have already enthroned our bread king a long time ago, and that it's only in losing this sense of security that we've come to, rely, to realize how much we've relied upon those forces and those systems like the economy or the health system to provide the security that they do. And when our bread king could no longer keep us safe, how did that feel? How have we responded to that? I've seen us looking for new bread kings, for new people or ideologies to follow us, or to, so that we can follow to keep us fed. I've seen us hate and scapegoat those things or those people that we perceive to be the problem, Trump or Biden or Fauci, the CDC, the Chinese, anti-vaxxers, masks. I've seen us get angry and complain about the restrictions placed on our activities and our gatherings. Restrictions intended to keep us safe because they seem too onerous or too unnecessary. And I can't help but wonder if we're not actually angry, but rather hangry. We're angry because we're hungry. Not for bread, but for security, for normalcy, for a time when we didn't have to live in fear. Maybe that's why we make such a fuss about all the small things like eating in restaurants or wearing masks, because these little things remind us that the danger is still there when we prefer to believe that it has passed. I worry sometimes that we are too ready to seize our next bread king by force that we will be too easily satisfied with our small victories, that we will make obeisance to whoever or whatever can make us feel normal again. Even going back to church. In the story, Jesus resists this. He doesn't want to just be another bread king. He's not there to make people feel safe and full and content. In the coming weeks, we're going to read about how he has come 
to give us so much more than that. Immediately after this feeding miracle, the next time the disciples see him, he's walking on water. Even today, that phrase, walking on water, is used to describe someone who is or who might as well be the divine. It's a reminder that in the face of what Jesus really offers, it's almost disappointing how little it takes to satisfy us. One of the other effects of this pandemic is that for whatever reason, we have finally as a society started to pay attention to the people who never felt safe or protected. That very feeling that we wish to get back to is a luxury and a privilege that's not been enjoyed by everyone in our society or our world. I almost wonder if it was having that comfort finally stripped away from us that made us able to see the places and the people who never had it finally made us understand their situation in a new way because we finally knew something firsthand of what it's like to be without those things. What does it say about us that we are so eager to get back to something that some of us never had? What does our own hunger for security teach us about the experience of people of color or about the wealth that we enjoy? What does it teach us about the longing those people feel? The lengths to which they are go willing to go to attain what we have always taken for granted? How does our longing for normal help us to understand our neighbors who lack that privilege? I wonder if our hunger so frightens us that we fail to recognize it as a gift from God. Our society has been complacent with systemic injustice and exploitative economics because those things have kept our bellies full. But our experience of hunger during this pandemic has awakened in us the possibility of something better. I, for one, pray that we will not be sated again merely by bread and circuses. Maybe that hunger is more of a blessing than we realize. Right now, we are all hungry. Hungry to get back to the way things were. Back to worship in person without masks or other restrictions. Back to eating in restaurants. Back to going about our business as we always have. And yet, when I look out today, I see something greater than we had before. Because not only are we gathered in this room, we are gathered across space and even time, thanks to the gifts of our enforced pandemic sabbatical. That very hunger to be together when we couldn't physically gather is what made this wider gathering possible. And even in our hunger for corporate worship, we ought not to forget that we have been fed through this entire wilderness sojourn with phone calls and letters and Zoom gatherings and digital worship. We may be hungry, but we are not starving. I can't help but see this hunger as a blessing because through all of this, that hunger has held us together. And it's drawn us closer to God. Because I believe that God also is hungry. Just as we long for God, God longs for us. Enough to send Jesus to be the bread of life to feed us. Enough to give up divinity to become human. Enough to lay down God's own life for us. I think being hungry helps us know the hunger that God feels. In the weeks to come, we will read about a very hungry Jesus, 
A Jesus longing to proclaim the good news to people who ate their fill of the loaves, to give them the life that is eternal, to raise them up on the last day. As I think about the future of the church, I sometimes wonder if we focus too much on trying to feed people, either spiritually or physically, and not enough on recognizing and even cultivating our hunger for the possibility of a deeper communion with God. In this story, it's that hunger that drove the crowds to try to make Jesus their king. It's also what will bring them across the lake to Capernaum to find him again. The tragedy of the story is when so many of them give up on that hunger and turn away, believing it will never be filled. I, for one, am glad for this hunger. For it's what brought each of us here today, either in person or online. It feels good to finally feed that hunger. But that hunger also reminds us that whatever satisfaction or comfort or joy that we get from being able to worship in person or go out to eat or whatever other loaves we're eating that are filling us, that these things are just a foretaste of the feast to come. A hint of the experience of God's infinite love and presence. I wonder if maybe we as the church have become complacent with mere bread when Christ has been standing in our midst offering us so much more. Today, as we celebrate our ability to worship in person together again, we also remember that we can never go back to what was. That we don't want to go back to what was, that we are moving forward. In that way, I think that we're a little bit like the disciples in the boat, in the dark, on the rough water. We're paddling across the sea, still between the place where we are and the place where we will be. The place where we saw the feeding and, the, and not yet come to the place where we learn what that means. It's interesting how John describes what happens when they see Jesus in that moment. He says they wanted to take him into the boat. Not that they did, but that they wanted to. And when they wanted to, immediately the boat reached the place where they were headed. Isn't that strange? I confess I don't quite know what to make of that. But as I think about it, I start to wonder if maybe that's a way of saying that as soon as as the disciples overcome their fear and wish to travel with Jesus, as opposed to, say, trying to make him a bread king, then they reach their destination. That maybe that destination isn't so much a place as it is a posture of wanting to be closer to Jesus, whatever that might mean. Is our hunger calling us back to the place where we ate our fill of the loaves? Or is that hunger drawing us forward along the road along which Jesus wishes to lead us?